one of us uses 34 kilograms of stuff every day. That's the telephone you have, the car that drove you here, the meal you just had, and even the bricks in your home. And of that 34 kilograms, 31 kilograms is wasted, which means that more than 90% of everything we use is wasted. Or, on the flip side of that, 9% of everything um, we use actually makes it back into our economic system. Only 9%. But we've been, become very good at getting rid of our waste and hiding it. So if you waste stuff in your house, you have the garbage collector picking it up, driving it out of the city to a landfill or an incinerator, burning it or burying it underground. What would happen if we would make that visible again? If that vast majority of waste, if that would be visible, what if you would have to sleep next to it? Let's imagine that. So 34 kilograms every day. So the first day would be quite okay. I mean, it would be bearable. Day two, it would already pile up and it would be difficult even to cover it up. Day three, maybe your banana peels would start to smell. But on day 10, you have 350 kilograms of stuff just next to your bed, how would that look? What would happen in a year? Or think of how old you are now. Is that a sustainable model? Not really, right? And yet, that's the world we live in. But it hasn't always been that way. Four and a half billion years ago, uh, when this planet was formed, everything was perfectly circular. 200,000 years ago, the first humans came to this planet still very circular. 6,000 years ago, modern civilization, very circular. And then something happened 200 years ago with the Industrial Revolution, where we started to extract coals out of the earth, iron to build trains to make transportation easier. That was really the time when we started to refine a model of take, make, waste. Take, make, waste. That's a model that we refined 200 years ago, and we're still living in that reality today. But I want to talk today about the hope that I have that we can change that system, and actually that we're, in some parts of the world, already doing that. So that will be kind of the nature of my talk. But taking a step back, what has got us where we are today, in every sense, is the linear economy. It has brought us great wealth at tremendous living standards to some people in some parts of the planet at certain times. But it has done so at a very great cost. And that cost keeps on being extracted from our planet and the people living on it. And embedded very deep in that take-make-waste tradition of the linear economy is a very toxic cocktail um, of very negative consequences, being social inequality, being pollution, depletion of natural resources, increasing risks of climate change. And if we want to change that system around, we really need to alter fundamental things in our world. Because we live in a resource-constrained world, and we're dealing with some hyper-trends like rapid population growth, increasing urbanization of a global community. And our linear model that, we, that we've built so carefully over the last 200 years is no longer fit for purpose. So we are at an historic economic and cultural tipping point. Do we keep on tweaking and tampering a broken linear system or do we pivot to a circular system, one that's truly sustainable? And I want to show some figures to, to put all of this um, a bit in perspective. So what you see here is 150 years of resource use, starting at 1900, all the way to the left, um, and going all the way to 2050. So in 1900, we extracted out of the earth 7 billion tons of stuff, iron ore, coal, biomass for timber. And already in 2015, that ran up to 84 gigatons. And actually, even between 1970 and now, it has tripled. But what you see here is that 
in the next 30 years or so, it will even double of where we stand today. It will go to 175, somewhere around 175 billion tons of materials. And it's actually good that we do that because we're allowing people to be lifted out of poverty, to live comfortable lives, and it's needed with so many people um, being born on this planet every day, but it can't be in a model where we keep extracting. So there needs to come a point where we decouple the prosperity growth with material use. And really the, the circular economy, at the heart of the circular economy is the idea of moving away from that system of take, make, waste into a model of take, make, take, make, take, make, into perpetuity. That's, that's, the, that's the aim. And what you see here is that linear economy. So we, we take, we refine, we produce, we use, and we discard. And in contrast, what the circular economy wants to do is to close cycles, so to repair if possible, um, to refurbish um, an old computer, an old laptop computer, or an old car, refurbish, where it re maintains its value. And if nothing else is possible, then eventually recycle it. But that's only the least option. But what we definitely not want to do is burn it or bury it underground. And what I want to show is a, a short video of what that just really looks in actual practice. So this is extraction practices and really puts illustration to the graph I just shown. So just big shovels taking stuff out of the earth. So this is the iron ore that we're digging up, the aluminum ore, this is the oil that we're drilling um, at sea. And we're producing all kind of intermediate products from that. So this is the production of steel requiring a lot of energy. You make steel plates out of which you can produce um, auto parts. Eventually it goes into an assembly line where we make the products. So this is the same for all the products we use, whether it's a telephone, an automobile, eventually with one goal, that we constructed this whole resource reality, and that's to use it. In this case, to drive to your friends, to your family, to commute, to work. That's the only reason why we're digging up stuff out of the earth. But it's not necessarily because this is also the practice, that we're getting rid of it very quickly, too quickly, too soon, with too limited opportunities to, to cycle it back. And what I want to show once more and really kind of summarize a bit is that model that we have been looking at. So we're doing it all for, for society. We're taking things out of the earth. We're making stuff out of it. We're wasting it and we're disposing it. What we do too little is cycle it. And therefore, and that's the title of my presentation, we are faced with a huge circularity gap. There's a huge gap um, to be filled. And the question is, what does this model do for that 31 kilograms of waste that ends up next to your bed? Or in 10 days, the 300 kilograms or so. What can you do to change this system? Sure, you can take your um, old bottles, don't throw them in the bin, but bring them to a recycling, provided there is a recycling infrastructure. You can use your old food waste and compost it. You can maybe repair your jeans instead of buying a new. And that's all great, but more needs to be done. So we really need to tackle this with all relevant institutions, because that same model needs to apply to a city or to a nation, or to the business you work in. It really requires collaborative effort on, on all those fronts. And I will give kind of four strategies that you can apply at home, in your business, in the city you live in, to, to get to that circular economy. One is to cycle more. And what, for example, the city I live in, in Amsterdam, making great strides for, is to use the urine of one million people living in Amsterdam, and what they do is they create fertilizer out of that, that you can apply back on the land, rather than to discard of it in, into the river. That's a very effective way, just cycle more. Another one is to optimize. This is a great example of Fairphone, it's a fully modular phone, they're called Fairphone because they have fair sourcing of all their materials that go into the phone, 
And it just provides you also as a consumer a choice. Do I buy a Fairphone? Do I buy another phone? This is the one you, that you can self-repair because it has a modular build. And third, we need to stop wasting. Well, as I said, we need to stop and prevent the system from happening where we have single-use plastic bottles that eventually end up in the sea, causing the plastic soup or the exhaust fumes from our cars ending up, so we need to go to um, electric driving. And the other thing, if we do all of those three things very effectively, we can hopefully get rid of that hockey stick curve I showed you earlier by stop extracting, or at least really limit it to um, the bare necessities that we need. But this whole system really requires, as I said, policymakers, cities, the mayor's office, national governments, businesses, and we need to cross-collaborate and really find new ways to look at that aspirational future. So what I've showed you today is really a snapshot of kind of the research that we've done. So I really encourage you to, to visit our website where you see much more infographics, background materials on this, but there's also the opportunity to, to uh, join the conversation with us on this. Um, so really encourage you to go to circularity-gap.world. And uh, I'd like to thank you very much.